All right, welcome everybody. And thanks to those of you that were already here for the reading group prior to this. Um, the, the bad part, if you were here, you'll have to hear some repeated stuff. So um, first of all, thank you all for coming to this. Uh, this is, I guess, the fifth event in our Borghese Mellon workshop on psychedelic past, presence, and futures, um, funded by the Youth Center for Humanities here at UW-Madison. So the proposal for this workshop grew out of a working group. Um, many of the people in that working group are here today. Uh, of people that are thinking about psychedelics and psychoactives from humanities and disciplines outside of the sciences. Um, and so all across campus, English, uh, Allen Centennial Gardens, School of Human Ecology, the Holt Center, Latin American Studies, et cetera. Um, and really thinking about fostering conversations about psychedelics and society, society um, as a means to generate a deeper understanding of what quote unquote psychedelic studies might look like in the years ahead. Um, and so really interested in the how of those conversations and how understandings will take place and how they're operationalized. Um, so lots of questions to consider. Is it possible to reconcile psychedelics as medicine, sacraments, and dangerous drugs? Who do the compounds and plants benefit? Who has access? How are they being commodified? And what are the political and societal stakes of consciousness shifting? So really contextualizing sociocultural and biomedical developments in psychedelic science and medicine, and aiming to kind of bridge gaps between the humanities and health sciences. Um, so quick shout outs. Thank you to the Center for Humanities, uh, Megan Messino and Marion Ladd, who've helped a lot with all kinds of logistical concerns. Um, Tyler Dewar, Sally Griffith-O, Kristen Falzone, who's our graphic designer, Andrew Leinberger, who helped us set up our IT today, um, Pam Chizek and John Isaac. Um, and of course, our guest speaker today, Dr. Kwasi Adusi, who I will introduce in just a moment. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just wanted to also mention, um, this is our first kind of speaker that we've had as like a kind of lecture. And what I'm really excited about is that this workshop has really, um, we were given kind of feedback that, um, I'm just trying to get in. Um, the workshop is really meant to not so much highlight polished work or things that are done and kind of present on finished work, but rather to um, offer a space on campus for people to kind of workshop emerging things. So with that context, um, I'm really excited to introduce Quasi. So Dr. Quasi Adusi, who's a doctor of nursing practice and a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner, is a service-oriented, curious Ghanaian native passionate about the intersections of community, well-being, and technology. He has a vision for a future driven by inner and outer restoration and how they converge to the maladaptive systems of our current world. Um, as an educator and community organizer, he is informed by his experience with the war on drugs and community mental health, both as a patient and a clinician. He is also a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner, co-founder of the Psychedelic Society of Western New York, and led the development of a grassroots psychedelic harm reduction organization called the Sanctuary Project. And so Kwasi and I met at Alex Grace Chapel of Sacred Mirrors, for those of you who know what that is, mm -hmm. um, in 2019 for a Zendo Project training. And he's a uh, which is a sort of psychedelic peer support uh, training program sponsored by MAPS. And I've been kind of scheming to bring him here ever since, so I'm really excited. I've been consulting with Madison Psychedelic Society on sort of a min Midwest harm reduction initiative. Um, and so, yeah, super happy that he's here, and he's going to kind of encourage the audience to expand our mantra for preparing for psychedelic ex experiences from set and setting to set and setting and support. So I'll let him elaborate. And all that means in regard to community equity and internal resourcing. So thanks. Thank you. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Welcome. Great introduction, by the way. Um, so obviously in Zoom times, we don't have as many opportunities to do this sort of thing, um, like in person, particularly for me. So I think what's always super helpful and just kind of easing into uh, vulnerable being, public speaking, being in front of people, so on and so forth. It's just kind of like shaking a little bit. <laughs> so anybody wants to join me, they're more than welcome, <laughs> including those who are behind the Zoom screen. That's <laughs> good. That's great. Yeah, I think it's always good to know the ways in which you are able to regulate yourself. Is often sometimes people might do a meditation, which can help with regulation, but sometimes movement is a thing that can be helpful in regulating. And so we'll sort of circle back to that later on. Um, is there a way that I might be able to mute the sound from here or would it like, um, it's okay if not. 
I can try to trouble. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. The email sounds and stuff. Yeah. What are you talking? Let's just give one second here. Okay. Um, and I'm happy to just go ahead and get started while we're getting that set up. So it's my email that's the culprit. So <laughs> I was already thinking about that, but I didn't want to disturb you. So uh, thanks for no worries. Okay. Here's the presenter. Yep, post me There we go. Awesome. <clears throat> So beyond set setting and support, or rather beyond set and setting, cultivating mosaics of support. Um, as mentioned, of course, this is sort of like a space to workshop ideas, if you will. And this is something that's sort of been, um, I think, on my mind for a little bit of time, uh, this idea of set and setting and how we might be able to sort of expand on our perception of what that means. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to be able to do that. Um, this is a little bit of an agenda. So I'll kind of start with just a little bit of a context through my personal narrative, um, my involvement sort of in community work, um, how that sort of evolved into doing clinical work and how that sort of shaped the perspectives that I might be sharing with you, you know, throughout this presentation. We'll dive a little bit into this history of set and setting. I think many people are pretty familiar with that sort of adage at this point, uh, but we'll dive a little bit deeper into what it means and um, how we might be able to start moving into expanding that idea into what I call mosaics of support. So some people might have recognized it in the introduction that was wonderfully presented by Amanda. Um, often, this is something that comes from uh, colleague, mentor, you know, so many things. Marcina Hale, uh, who somebody else here knows who Marcina is from Reconsider, Reconsider. They helped to produce fantastic fungi, but also they've been holding this space in New York, seeking to bridge the medical and the mystical, the scientific and the sacred, and holding these really beautiful gatherings, one of which was a gathering for nurses. So if there's any nurses here, I know there's one right there, a couple, it looks like. And if there's anybody here, shout out, yeah, nurses. Um, <laughs> which was always like such a lovely opportunity to connect on that level. And one of the concepts that she sort of introduced me to was this sort of um, compass, if you will. And so what we see at the north of this yin yang is mind, which sort of represents analyzing. Um, towards the west, we see body, which represents manifesting. Uh, at the south, we have heart, which represents passion. And then towards the east, we have spirit, which represents dreaming. And often when we are introducing ourselves in various capacities, you might be able to split this line in half because we tend to live as a society in this sort of mind analyzing and body manifesting space. And so certainly it's the way that we present ourselves too. And what she taught was an idea of instead introducing yourself starting from the heart. Because when we think about what we do for children in particular when they ha have sort of an expansion of passion and an expansion of dreaming we sort of meditate them so here's an invitation i think in sort of a psychedelic space to do things differently and we can start just in the way that we sort of introduce ourselves and so you know as uh, it was mentioned i tend to introduce myself starting with being like a really curious person um sometimes really introverted sometimes extroverted it depends on the weather outside i guess um, you know, I find myself to be really vulnerable as a, a human being, sometimes my deficit, sometimes it's really helpful, but I tend to see it as a way to be able to connect really deeply with people. Um, as far as dreaming, as mentioned, you know, I really see a world where everybody has a sense of agency, where people have access to internal resources and external resources so that their life, their well-being, their experience on this planet can be as conducive and as comfortable as possible. And there are so many ways in which people might be able to offer that to the world. Um, and many of those pieces that are ultimately represented here in what we are going to call the mosaic of support. And then, of course, there's the mind piece, which I recognize mental health is something that is so crucial to um, our wholeness and our well-being. And it was clearly one of the drivers for me going into the career that I'm in now, which it's manifested as a psychiatric nurse practitioner, 
where I currently work at Journey Clinical, where we offer uh, ketamine-assisted psychotherapy, um, or rather we give the opportunity for therapists who are working with patients, might have been working with them for many years, maybe you're feeling a little stuck in the work that they're doing, um, giving them access to um, ketamine prescriptions for their patients so that they can turn every sort of therapist office into essentially a psychedelic clinic. Um, and so I've been really fortunate to see the amount of beauty coming from a space like, like that. Um, we have an hour and a half. I'll try to be really mindful. I feel like I have a lot of content here. Again, we're workshopping, we're workshopping. So <laughs> it's good. Um, and so just as some background, the way that I sort of got into the space, I learned of the MAP psychedelic dinners that was happening many years ago, trying to raise money for the MDMA trials. Um, in doing so, there was a community in Buffalo who sort of came out to support it. I didn't realize that there were so many other people who were thinking about psychedelics from this perspective of not only a recreational and party substance, but certainly something that can help with the expansion of our healing capacity, our internal healing capacity. So when people showed up for this event, we thought, hey, let's you know uh, formalize this in some capacity. So we started the Psychedelic Society and um, of Western New York. And one of the things that we recognize, I think many people who have psychedelic experiences, is this really unique function where you start to think a lot more about how you can take better care of yourself, how you can take better care of people around you, and how you can take better care of the planet. So ultimately, we thought perhaps we can use the Psychedelic Society as an opportunity to help people with their integration through these different domains, um, whether it's through integration circles and education, to clean up that we were doing in the environment. We had a community garden that we started that we shared with um, a refugee population that was on the west side of Buffalo. And we did a lot of community service. Um, I think at the time it was something where psychedelics had a pretty heavy stigma, very different than what we see today. And it was really interesting because as an opportunity to integrate our psychedelic experiences through service, through giving, volunteering in different capacities, um, it also gave people an opportunity to learn that psychedelic users are maybe not what they thought, um, that we can sort of shift the perspective in some capacity for how people might uh, look at somebody who is looking to psychedelics, psilocybin, LSD for their personal use, whether it's through recreation or if it's for enhancing their creativity, what have you. Um, and so that also laid essentially this really beautiful fertile ground for the psychedelic risk reduction work where um, we ended up meeting through that process. And so psychedelic risk reduction, as many are familiar with, there's the Zendo project. They started at Burning Man, supporting people um, through difficult psychedelic experiences, building a tent. We really, I think at the time, didn't see many opportunities to get engaged in psychedelic work, um, certainly not above ground, there wasn't as many research opportunities or professional opportunities, and Zendo seemed like really the only way to do that, but it was really inaccessible for us. We couldn't make it out to Burning Man, we couldn't go to Africa Burn, so we thought, hey, let's go to some Zendo trainings, and then let's like slowly start iterating and seeing if we can apply what we learned through those trainings to this sort of grassroots model. Certainly, I think that empowerment is a piece where I know I'm always going to be thinking of how we can increase and how we can build more of and sort of empowering includes access to different kinds of resources so that, you know, as a community, you might be able to take care of yourself as a community, as opposed to sort of relying so much on sort of other systems. And that was the framing that we had going into the development of the sanctuary project. So we templated everything so that if anybody wanted to sort of pick up this model and apply it in different states, different counties, so on and so forth, that we'd have the support available for them to be able to do that and show what a grassroots uh, sort of risk reduction and grassroots community support model could look like through this perspective. Um, and starting off with a few people, uh, you know, really passionate about offering this kind of support. Ultimately, we raised enough money to get a permanent space on the land where we were having these festivals. So that we could really model what it looks like to have this be a function of uh, environment where psychedelic use is certainly higher than it would be anywhere else. Um, and it's still there today. So, um, you know, COVID kind of put a halt on things, but certainly 
we were able to get things started back up this past uh, July. The Blue Heron. At the Blue Heron, yeah. Is that the one that you? Is that, I was just asking if that's where the permanent. Yeah, so it's at the Blue Heron, yep. The permanent space. Mm -hmm. um, so all of those really laid, as I mentioned, the foundation that I have professionally in doing some of this community work. When I started um, as a nurse practitioner, um, I started to see sort of like a different perspective um, as a clinician, um, ultimately as a patient myself, who started seeing a therapist and going through psychiatry and seeing what things look like from different perspectives. And one, recognizing all of the deficits that existed within the medical system, which I think many people are full aware of now, um, recognizing uh, the deficit that we have of taking care of the people who are within this healthcare system, who are trying to show up in their fullest selves to support other people, but recognizing that's also a sacrifice that they're making and giving some of themselves in order to do that sort of work um, and thinking that there isn't enough support for those people. There was a lot of concern about sort of access. There were so many people who I met with, saw as a student, as a clinician, who were my patients, struggling with pretty significant trauma. And knowing that or psilocybin or MDMA in particular was a treatment option, but there were all of these barriers in place that would prevent them from getting access to that. And even if they did get access to that, there was this recognition that we don't, I don't know that we have sort of a system, like a network to support people through these altered state experiences that can radically shift and, you know, discombobulate and then reframe our essential sense of selves. Um, and so when we're coming into the world and we have limited resources, can we go through that sort of earth shattering, shattering experience and sort of not cause even more harm if there isn't that element of support? And so I'm just going to go into a bit of the history of set and setting because that all laid the foundation for why I started to think that we needed to have a bit of an expansion beyond just set and setting. And so generally set and setting, I think maybe I'll just put it out there if somebody wants to just share what set and setting is, do some audience participation. Bueller. Preparation of the environment. One more time. The preparation of the subject. The preparation the, of the environment. The, the uh, person. Okay. And then the preparation of the environment. So that that captures it, right? So set being this, um, you know, all of the internal elements that somebody might be coming in with, and then setting being the environment in which that experience might be had. And so we generally look at these two components of set and setting as these, we call it extra pharmacological factors um, that sort of shape the effects of the drug. And so certainly in indigenous cultures, this is something that's been honored. Um, the way that traditional medicine circles are held are in high reverence for this element of set and setting through ritual, through music, through sense, um, even through religious sort of context frameworks, suggestions that might include how we bring some intentionality into these kinds of medicine spaces. Um, but in the West, we have Timothy Leary, who was ultimately credited with the term set and setting. And the idea here was to sort of highlight both of these concepts as crucial in shaping these psychedelic experiences. And in doing so, it was sort of like a catchy meme, if you will, um, that had a lot of utility from both a harm reduction perspective and also by giving sort of a linguistic tool for researchers and therapists even, um, in a way that would sort of encapsulate so many of these different variables that allow the experience to be what it ultimately is for many people. And so I like to sort of think of set as like a color palette. And so it's sort of this color palette of set that sort of paints our experience that might include our mood and our beliefs, our intentions, our, perspe our perceptions, our attitudes, our personality even. And so we might have these long um, range elements of set that include things like our personality. And then we have our shorter range immediate um, elements of set that includes how we're feeling in a moment. And uh, oh. a little better. And so with this sort of color palette of set, I think it really helped with 
laying that foundation for people recognizing all of the needs for preparation. Oh, I got to call my mom. Oh, I got to like check that thing off my to-do list, right? So you're trying to clear your set, if you will. And then of course, with setting, what we've learned about the impact of psychedelic use in nature and maybe how it changes if we're at a party environment, just bringing in a little bit more of a recognition into all of those pieces. And of course, I think of setting as this sort of crucible because it heightens in many respects all of the elements that pertain our set to help with foraging, if you will, whatever that experience might be. And so it can certainly heighten in many respects itself, the space, the music, people that you're around, sort of things in the environment, and also just how safe you feel, like your, your feelings of safety. Um, all of those pieces can uh, contribute to your experience as part of this um, dual set and setting. But ultimately, as I've said, there's been something that's kind of been bubbling up, which is that uh, for a long time, set and setting was enough, I think particularly as a harm reduction principle, but we're seeing a really big change, um, particularly in the amount of use Psychedelic use across the nation is skyrocketing. There are so many more people who are interested in or having these sorts of events, right? Um, people are interested in doing psychedelics. And I think because of the capacity, the amounts, the volume even of psychedelic use that's happening, we have to start thinking about adding that element of support to frame for people. Well, it's not just about the music in the room and you know how I feel that day, but it's also like, what kind of support do you have around you? to help with better contextualizing the experience that you might have, and then also being able to integrate into um, a sort of renewed version of yourself. And so we'll dive a little bit into all of those pieces too. And so as we sort of bubble up and burst into this mosaic of support, which you know are the collections of the many pieces that sort of come together to create this beautiful artwork, if you will, of an individual being supported and feeling supported and, and thus for many people going out and supporting other people in the same way. It's sort of a never ending um, bit of a process. But what happens for a lot of people when we undergo a psychedelic experience is this a sense of newness, right? And it happens for many different neurological reasons. So for us, we're practicing primarily with ketamine right now. With, uh, without getting too much into the nitty gritty of it, we think that it reopens this phase that children have between the ages of three and seven, that's called the critical period. And during this critical period, there's this huge outburst of neuronal growth and you can just learn things super easily, like language, I can just pick up super easily. I'm just learning a way of being and walking. You start to pick up the mannerisms of the people around you without trying very much. And so we think that what ketamine does and psychedelics can do is help to reopen this sort of critical window in some capacity that helps you one, with seeing the world differently, which many people certainly have that experience, um, and two, uh, developing new habits, new ways of being in relationship to yourself, being in relationship with your environment. There's a lot of newness. And so I think of it quite often through the perspective of uh, what it might be like as a child. And so what are the ways, what are the things, what are the theories in child development that we might be able to look to to help contextualize how as adults having these psychedelic experiences bringing us into a sense of newness that we might be able to glean some insight from. So one of the theories is um, Bronfenbrenner's ecological systems theory. Is anybody here familiar with it? Yeah. <laughs> are you a child? Yeah, uh, the School of Human Ecology and Human Development and Feminist Studies. Oh, beautiful. So that's our center model. <laughs> so, yeah, so crucial and being able to contextualize an individual to think of all of the pieces that you might have to consider if you're doing research in child development, right? If you're thinking about um, the ways that you might be able to um, meet the needs of a child, all of these different layers are super helpful. Um, so, Brunt Preventer sort of breaks down this ecological model um, into five different elements. So we have going from the outside in, the macro system, and then the exosystem, meso, micro, and then sort of the individual. So what the remainder of this talk will look like is an inspection of each one of these different layers and how we might be able to incorporate one, a consideration about uh, support. Um, in the context of the different system and then all the things that you might be able to do to add some support for those considerations.
So we will start with the macro system. So the macro system includes culture, ethnicity, broader economic factors, policy, social conditions, right? Is this like very high order um, layer that impacts the child, that impacts us, right? So um, there are some people who they see brown converters and they ultimately think that this element of the macro system should actually be at the center. That we should bring culture to the center because it's so fundamental to the way that we relate to um, ourselves and other people. But there are some elements here that I just wanted to sort of share related to the macro system because obviously we won't have time again into every little piece of it, but the parts of it that really stick out to me, um, I just wanted to focus on a bit. So um, starting with the cultural piece. So Regarding the cultural piece, as I mentioned, there are some who would like to have culture actually at the center of of that sort of ecological model and systems theory. And there's a study that talks a little bit about thinking of set as something that is influenced also by culture. Um, and so in the study in particular, they talk about race being um, a huge component of set and setting. Um, and that's sort of for a variety of reasons. So for one, there's going to be psychosocial processes that are sort of associated with racial socialization that might impact the way that you are feeling motivated to go into an experience, as an example. And thus, based off of what your motivations might be, that might certainly lead to a different uh, interpretation of your experience. And then the way that you sort of integrate your experience is going to be very different based off of your cultural sort of um, framing. So. In addition to it having sort of direct impacts on your motivation, I think especially uh, many people of color might look to psychedelic use, and this is something that's just more of an observation, to work through intergenerational trauma, as an example, right? And so if that's the intention, how is that going to show up in your experience itself? Are you going to be meeting with your ancestors, right? Are you going to be processing physically, emotionally, the things that perhaps your ancestors might have gone through? Um, in a much more likely circumstance than if that wasn't necessarily part of what your motivation was. So certainly we can think of culture as a major part of um, both set and setting. I think in addition to it, of course, there are all of the things that are going on or have been going on um, in America with race relations, sort of the tensions there, that certainly adds uh, an element um, to somebody's ability to sort of like relate in spaces where drugs are being used, whether that's in therapy, whether that's out in the community. So all of those pieces sort of impact, as I mentioned, sort of color, the perspective that we might have about things that are going on, our interpretations about things that are going on, our feelings and sense of safety, right? Um, all of those pieces are gonna be sort of impacted in uh, various degrees by uh, the sort of cultural framework. So uh, I don't know how many people here are maybe interested in becoming like psychedelic therapists. So if you, or maybe doing research in psychedelic, maybe already doing research in psychedelics, yeah. So a few. Um, so often the conversations that I'll have with folks around this conversation, I get a pretty consistent question around it. And usually it's coming from uh, people who are uh, maybe wanting to work as therapist clinicians, perhaps even in research and asking like, how do we work with communities of color? Like, how do I, I had a question recently. It was, uh, what happens if you have a patient and you don't share ethnic identity, um, but you're the only person who can offer this kind of medicine to them? You know, like, what do I do in that sort of circumstance? So, what I want to sort of suggest here as one of the elements of support for those who are experiencing this elements of um, culture impacting their set, impacting their setting, is about, I think, two major pieces here. So cultural humility over cultural competency, right, which I think we're becoming a lot more familiar with that idea now, right? So when we think of cultural competency, it's, all right, I know how to work with Black people. Like I have like the guidebook on, on how black people work and how they respond to therapy in this way and that way and so on and so forth. And what cultural humility says is, I don't know anything. <laughs> so I'm gonna go in asking a lot of questions. And I often will share an example, a personal example where in therapy myself, I remember 
Um, this is during sort of the height of a lot of the racial tensions. I have a therapist at the time, I had a therapist who was a, a white clinician who um, sort of kept asking me, inquiring about how I was feeling about what was going on, how am I relating to all the things that are happening. And certainly there were things that were happening in my family, like in my family unit home that were much more pressing for me. Those were the things that I was hoping to sort of process. But certainly there was an assumption that this piece that's happening right now is the thing that you need to be working on in this moment, right? And so simply making assumptions, I think, is never going to be right. What do you say? Um, assumptions or as of you and me, yeah, something like that, yeah. And more compassion, I see, right? But but certainly this element of cultural humility makes a really big difference because as somebody who identifies as sort of a black man, I can further identify as a Ghanaian man. I can further identify as a Ghanaian man who likes to rock climb, you know. And so I can continue that that sort of um, elements of identity and all of these pieces of myself that I relate to. And then you start to see how unique every single individual is. And so in that framing, how might we be able to move in with a little more humility and just ask questions. And sometimes it takes that element of radical vulnerability, right? Um, to do that, because it doesn't feel like an easy thing to do. Um, I think that modeling is often a really helpful thing and sharing vulnerability um, can really be helpful with forming the connections that might allow for those conversations to be had a little bit more easily. But what I also suggest often to the folks who are inquiring of how do I work with different races, cultures, so on and so forth is to start maybe with exploring um, their identity development. So identity development, there's an article that's gonna be in here where you would be able to get a little bit more detail it's sort of split into uh, two different pieces. So just to give a little bit of contextualizing, um, when we talk about identity development, you have sort of the dominant identity that somebody might ascribe to, and then you have sort of the non-dominant identity that somebody might ascribe to. And you tend to see that there's an identity development that's happening in some parallel fashions, and it shows up sort of in a therapeutic space with some of the questions about how I might be able to work with people of different races and identities. And so in minority identity um, development, it is conformity, dissonance, resistance, introspection, and integrative awareness. And we'll kind of like move through this a little bit quickly because I know it is a lot, um, but certainly we'll have plenty of time for questions if anything came up after. So in the conformity space, um, people of color might accept the values of the majority culture without a critical analysis. And they might sort of overvalue white role models and white standards of beauty and success and believe it to be better to be white. And so assuming that, of course, in the context that we're speaking of, white is the dominant culture. So in the dissonance stage, um, an individual might, like a person of color, might acknowledge the personal impact of racism when a triggering event causes the person to question and examine their own assumptions and beliefs. And they might become more aware of racism and experience confusion and conflict toward a dominant cultural system. Then we have the resistance stage where they might actively reject the dominant culture and immerse themselves in their own culture. They might feel hostility towards the dominant culture in this stage and um, in the context of therapy would refuse sort of a white therapist in this example. Then we have the introspection stage where a person of color might start to question the values of both his or her own ethnic group and a dominant group. And the person becomes more open to connecting with that dominant culture to better learn and understand differences. And then in the final stage of integrative awareness, a person might develop a cultural identity based on both minority and dominant cultural values. And they might feel comfortable with themselves and their own identity as a person of color in a multicultural society. And then look, the other hand of that, the other side of that, we have sort of the dominant group identity development, where um, it starts with contact where one might deny racism or cultural differences or dominant group membership, um, and maybe are referring to themselves or in some capacity as not seeing differences in races. And then you have disintegration where one might experience conflict over sort of moral dilemmas between choosing their own ethnic group um, and sort of greater humanity goals. Then you have a reintegration where there's gonna be some resolution of that dilemma 
But the way that might happen is through intolerance of other groups um, and taking almost a racial superiority bias. The last three, the next that comes up is pseudo-independence, which is where one begins limited acceptance and efforts to connect with people of color that share similarities. Immersion, where one develops increased understanding and acceptance of privilege, but may still act based on guilt. And then lastly, autonomy, where one might have gained acceptance of one's race, ethnic identity, and understand the role that they may or may not play in the perpetuation of racism, but certainly values diversity and feels less fearful and, in addition, less guilty about the reality of racism. So mouthful, there's a lot there, a lot there. But I also recognize this to be sort of a really compassionate process that we're all sort of going along these different levels of identity development that even for me, I know that I'm always going to be sort of moving and waxing and waning between my own sort of cultural identity. Um, that I think these conversations can certainly be difficult, but in thinking of how we might expand into this element of support, certainly an inquiry into our identity development and how that interacts with how we perceive others. And then in relation to that, are able to hold space for others, it, it's certainly uh, an important factor. And so within the therapeutic environment, what you might see is um, this here from um, an article that Mark Monica Williams wrote about, so social distance based on um, ethnic and racial identity. Um, and so this is in referring, this is referring to sort of the therapeutic dyad, the therapeutic relationship and where somebody's level of identity development might impact um, how that therapeutic relationship might develop or not develop. Um, and so, you know, all the way at the top, if you have a person of color who's in that conformity stage with a white therapist, they might actually be really close, um, but then not so close with like a minority client uh, or rather a minority therapist. And then all the way down to that integrative awareness is a little bit more closeness on either side of it. So I often will share that for those who are getting into therapy or thinking about therapy, wanted to work with communities that are marginalized or wanted to be more uh, adept at understanding their own sort of identity, recognizing that it's, of course, our professional responsibility and not the patient's responsibility, right, to work on that identity development and see how that sort of shows up in the context of the work that we might be doing or not doing. So I'll just take a pause because I feel like that was a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, and just kind of like let that see for a second. Um, and also because this piece here, I think is like a really, really important element. And certainly one of the pieces that I feel the most, um, I think, passionate about. So particularly because this is a room of folks in the community who are at the intersection of research and therapy, who are thinking about um, harm reduction in particular. And, you know, I really want to make a proposition that we should perhaps reimagine how we define psychedelic harm reduction. And so the reason why I say that is because there is an inherent harm in psychedelics, as we know, but there's certainly inherent risk. And so when we say psychedelic harm reduction, what we're actually meaning is psychedelic risk reduction. But certainly where the true harms come from are from the law, right? So I think that we need to also redefine how we think of psychedelic harm reduction as thinking through what are the efforts that might help with reducing the risk of legal harm, state-sponsored harm, if you will. Because especially as we have more conversations about psychedelics as healing and more people are using them, more people are also putting themselves at risk. Um, there was a nurse in Indiana not too long ago who maybe it's you know closer to the Midwest, so perhaps many people are aware of it, but was microdosing for anxiety, didn't do very well in therapy or rather with psychiatric medication and ended up getting arrested after I believe her daughter called the cops on her just because she was maybe upset about something. And initially the nurse was facing about 10 years in prison for psilocybin because this, you know, they showed up sort of in hazmat suits because there's just, a general lack of knowledge, right? People just don't understand. And so as far as they know, they thought it was maybe a meth lab or whatever it might be, and they were afraid that the spores were gonna get on them, but it just gives you an idea of how, you know, people outside of this room perhaps might be perceiving psychedelics and psychedelic medicine 
But nonetheless, those are stories that we're going to hear over and over and over again, because now all of these people are hearing that there's maybe a solution for all of the struggling that they've been going through, all of the suffering, that maybe there's something that's going to help with breaking them through that stuckness. They recognize that they don't have easy access, and so they have to really take their healing into their own hands. And they do. And then as a result of that, they're suffering from state-sponsored violence, if you will. Right. And so I think it's something that we definitely need to consider as a collective of how we might be able to expand upon our perspective, our perception of what psychedelic harm reduction really means. So and some things that I'll add to this, you know, there are different things or different ways that support might look like in this context with this framing. Um, one of those is if you're a therapist, if you're a researcher, if you can add your voice to policy conversations, add your voice to um, sort of local decriminalization efforts, if it felt like something that you were sort of aligned to, it makes a big difference. Um, the folks who are helping to make the policies and the laws, they need to hear from the specialists, they need to hear from the people on the ground, but not just the individuals who are doing this work, but the ones who are finding healing through the, their own personal experiences. Um, I had an opportunity to support some of the lobbying efforts that was happening in California with SB 519, which was a bill that would have decriminalized um, psychedelics across the state of California. And one of the most powerful responses that we would get were when individuals shared about their healing, whether it was a New York City uh, police uh, man or fireman who had gone through some significant trauma and found support through psychedelic medicine and was able to redevelop a relationship with themselves and their families. That means a lot, right? So like people's personal experiences means a lot. Um, and in many ways, I think that our psychedelic ecosystem is where it is now because people are sharing their stories, right? And so these are the stories that provide the foundation for the anecdotes that we then use in research. So there's so much capacity and so much power in, in storytelling and sharing your story but of course, not everybody feels that level of comfort, and that's totally fine. Um, and so certainly in supporting other organizations like the Drug Policy Alliance, if it's a donation or whatever it might be, just staying up to date with a group like SSDP and finding ways that you might be able to add your voice to the policy conversation, I think that is an element of support that could be really crucial to this sort of macro level policy conversation. The last piece that we're going to maybe talk about within this macro system is the environment, just the general environment, right? I think this is huge. We talk about nature relatedness being such a core component of our healing. You know, the mystical experiences questionnaire, in fact, is one that's used in psychedelic research to essentially operationalize or um, better quantify the extent of spiritual experience which is measured by how connected you feel with things, right? So this element of being connected to nature um, has a positive correlation with positive outcomes. It's huge, it's important, right? But also we're also living in an environment where we're having to worry a little bit about the climate. We're having to worry a little bit about what the future might hold. So eco-anxiety is real, right? And so that's certainly gonna add to our contextualizing of our experiences to go through a an environment or into an experience where you feel this sense of connection, this oneness, this sense of like familial capacity with the planet, and then to recognize that, oh, we're like harming it, you know? So the Extinction Rebellion, which people might be familiar with, they are uh, eco um, civil disobedience organization started out of the United Kingdom. Their founder, in fact, states it was because of a psychedelic experience uh, particularly with LSD that led to um, starting uh, Extinction Rebellion, right? And so people are certainly going through these experiences of feeling this need to protect the environment, right? So what support might look like here is um, ways that we might be able to expand upon people's sense of ecological attachment and, so, and also expand upon people's uh, sort of like green action and I'll explain what that means a little bit. So there are ways in which for somebody undergoing a psychedelic experience that you might be able to increase their capacity for sort of nature relatedness, right? Through do, doing these uh, different practices, 
Um, and they're sort of like ecological mindfulness practices. It might be like going through a park and just, you know, having a practice of feeling connection with the tree that's next to you or like sort of like thanking the grass, <laughs> you know, um, th these these opportunities that you might have almost like microdoses of awe even, right? To just show some gratitude, like some felt gratitude for what all of this is and the beauty that we have accessible to us. And so in addition to that, there's also sort of what we call green action, that the practice of these two things, increasing your ecological mindfulness and also green action can help with bolstering your sense of agency, right? Which is sort of the thing that you want to do when you're struggling from that eco-anxiety. It's like, well, what can I do? Um, there was a study that looked at um, a few different elements. So there were different conditions or so a conservation condition, which you can call that sort of green action. And there are really basic things. I think there's a list of like 40 items. Things like turn the tap water off when you're brushing your teeth, turn the water off when you're shaving, like all of these basic things. These are green action items. And then there are also these ecological attachment items, right? Establish a relationship with a tree near your dorm. Say hello every time you pass it. So these other things. And so as a practice, you might have people actually take like, write all these pieces down and then just like pick one out of a, like a, a bowl once a day. And that's going to be my green action or my ecological attachment practice for today. How beautiful would that be as a part of our psychedelic preparation? And how beautiful would that be as part of our psychedelic integration as well? Um, and so that I think would be a really helpful resource in thinking about how we might be able to offer support from this context. So because it's a lot, I thought we'd maybe do like a little bit of a experiential micro meditation here. So maybe just, um, yeah, just like a 30 seconds to a minute of, of some grounding um, for all of those in Zuma and you're free to join us. I won't judge if you don't. Um, And I want to do this one because often, especially when we're in these sorts of environments and buildings like this, we're in concrete, there's al always this sort of reminder that there's nature everywhere, right? That we are nature. And also there's like uh, tree roots and mycelia underneath the ground where this building is. And so um, maybe we could just get started with closing your eyes if that feels good. And if you prefer, you can sort of just lower your gaze to. Slowly just allowing yourself to settle into your body, into your seat. It's becoming aware of the sounds, smells, feelings, sensations. Just noticing. And as you continue to deepen your embodiment, to feel your base, to be felt, to be held by gravity in so many respects, I want you to just imagine that you have roots from underneath you just growing into the ground. Just growing deeper and deeper. asking yourself, how does that feel? There's this reminder that we have where no matter where, no matter what, the earth always has our back. We're a part of it, a part of her. That she can hold us and through a connection with her, she can heal us. And so I'd invite you to sort of start returning back slowly and gently into the space in ways that it might feel good for you. Whether it's through some movement. And also just thanking yourself for giving yourself a bit of a break. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely.
And so we're gonna start slowly coming back down to a close as we're starting to land a little bit. And one of the things that we're gonna move into is sort of the exosystem. And so we talk about this larger environment and so now moving in and zoning into the local environment. And so these networks, parks, um, within Bronson Brenner's model, it's about childcare, local government transport. Ultimately, it's, it's about resources, right? What are the resources that you have around you? So one of the things that I noticed or felt a recognition for was that perhaps for a long time, drug use might have been mapping onto my, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And so Maslow's hierarchy is one of these sort of developmental theories that says we have these basic needs that need to be met or are quite helpful if they are met so that we can sort of progress up to having our other needs met. And until we have those basic needs met, it's really difficult to get the needs that are a little bit more higher order to be met as well. So the most basic are our physiological needs, food, safety needs comes next, security, employment, and then you have sort of love and belonging, friendships, intimacy, esteem, self-actualization. And certainly I've sort of had this, like, this notion that perhaps drug use maps along this hierarchy in some capacity. And so when I thought for a long time about psychedelic users, that likely they're not worrying as much about safety needs or physiological needs that perhaps they're using psychedelics to deepen their relationships, that perhaps they're using psychedelics to figure out who they want to be in the world, what they want to give to the world, right? So these sort of the tip of the, the pyramid, if you will, how I might be able to give back. And I think that's shifting a little bit. And I think that's shifting because the narrative around psychedelics is shifting too. And so now that the narrative around psychedelics is really really surrounding this element of healing, access to healing, particularly for those who have been failed by the systems of before, that we have people who are seeking psychedelic medicine that are still struggling with their safety needs and are still struggling with their physiological needs to higher and higher degrees. And I think it's certainly worth the consideration. So I worked with MAPS on their diversity working group. And one of the things that we did was review a lot of the research protocols that they had and try to see where there might be gaps or places that we might be able to add different elements that could help with their research participants, particularly those who were uh, um, occupying marginalized um, identities, populations um, that had sort of limited resources because there was a pretty high dropout rate for many of the people that needed you know, the support likely more than many of the others, right? So they started thinking, well, I think if we're gonna do this kind of research, we have to include childcare. Like that has to be an element of support that we were offering. We have to include uh, sort of programs where if you're having to take off work for this, that you're not missing out on a, a full day's worth of paychecks, right? So if we wanna offer medicine to people who have these resource limitations that we have to start thinking about, how as a system, we might be able to fill in those gaps for them. And that it's almost the only way that it becomes possible is, is if we really think about those pieces. Um, there are also scholarship programs that are being put out there now for people who can't sort of afford ketamine assisted psychotherapy, but really need it. Um, the Ancestor Project has one. And um, there's another organization that I think Black People Trip that they just started a scholarship program. Um, I'm going to offer this to the group here. You know, I want to sort of curate this list of resources that include these scholarship programs, that include all of these different elements. And um, perhaps it could be a point of conversation after the fact to sort of connect on those and see how we might be able to expand upon these layers of support for people. But ultimately, I think that particularly after having come from healthcare and recognizing that you know, we need sort of social workers as an example, people who can sort of integrate and find the resources out there. We're gonna need psychedelic social workers too, right? To help with filling in many of these missing pieces. And I'm really happy to say that Columbia School of Social Work is developing a uh, psychedelic program um, in partnership with the UPenn School of Nursing. So it's really wonderful to hear that that's happening. 
And then the microsystem. So this is the setting in which the individual lives, person's uh, family, their peers, um, school, neighborhood. And this is a part that I think is really, really important. So when I think about the macro system, the element here that comes up is sort of my peer group, right? What are the communities in which I feel that I belong to? Like, who are the individuals that I feel a sense of connection with? And what we notice from psychedelic experiences is many people might undergo what we call an ego death, right? Which is a dissolution of your sense of self. And as you sort of come back from these ego death experiences and you start folding back into who you are, you start critically evaluating all of who you've been. And you start opening yourself up to the possibility that I've fallen into a social construct that isn't actually who I am. And so many people go through these experiences and part of their integration is actually what I'm calling like a psychedelic shutting. Right. And so it's kind of getting rid of um, these layers that didn't belong to us. Right. Or that we've perhaps outgrown in different capacities. And when you think about the butterfly going through this metamorphosis, when they're going through that transportation, that, that transformation, they're in a really fragile state. They're in a cocoon. Right. It's a sensitive period. It's no different for us when we're going through these changes, when we're going through the shedding, it's a sensitive stage. It's a really, really sensitive period. And what are all the things that we might need in order to support people who are going through that sort of shedding process that no longer feel that sense of connection with their church, where that's been a huge sort of support for them. And this happens. Um, I have a patient recently who, um, through a psychedelic experience, wanted to shed the story of being a cisgendered male and sort of came out, you know, in their relationship. Um, to their family, to their friends, and felt this sense of empowerment to be themselves fully and authentically, but didn't quite have the support around them through that experience, which only further deepened their sense of isolation, right? I mean, so we start thinking about, well, what are the communities out there? Are there integration circles? Are there virtual ones that can help with supporting people so that they can feel that sense of connection and community, because it's not just about integrating lessons into our lives. It's also about us integrating into the world. But when we don't really know where to integrate into, it becomes a really, really difficult problem, right? And so this is part of what um, would, you know, be part of the resources that we have already sort of started um, that would include different integration circles for people going through different things um, similar to this. And I think this piece around psychedelic shedding is, is a big one and is going to continue to be one where as people no longer feel the sense of relationship to an identity that they held before, that there's going to be the sensitive period where things are going to probably be pretty tough for a bit, right? Um, and it's something that must be, uh, we should expect in some capacity. And then there's also this conversation around stigma, you know. But for sake of time, I want to actually talk a little bit about uh, the relational dynamic. So within attachments, right? When we go through these psychedelic experiences, when we're on a healing process, we're not often thinking about the partners of the people who are on that healing process too. And certainly there can be some risk to that relational unit if there isn't sort of a co-evolution, if you will. You tend to see that um, there might be a split if you have one half of a dyad doing a lot of work and another half isn't necessarily because the way that they might be re relate especially in the context of psychedelic medicines, um, can be a little bit more difficult. And so that's something that needs support too. And sometimes it's just about having a conversation about that. Sometimes it's just about recognizing that this is a possibility. And it's not something that happens only in the context of psychedelic medicine. It's about any kind of sort of like spiritual and healing work. Um, so many people, you know, we call them sort of the affected other who um, are in a, a, a dyad where one person is really, really struggling and the person is another part of that diet is ultimately the caretaker is the space holder, right? And the story becomes really wrapped around the person who's going through sort of this like traumatic experience or an event, but certainly the person who is holding space is going through their own layers of, of need, right? And so this is another layer of support that I think is going to be really interesting or really necessary as we start expanding this notion of set and setting and set setting and support that we include in there, how are we supporting the people who are supporting those going through psychedelic medicine experiences? 
how are we including them a little bit differently or maybe being a little bit more cognizant of the possible um, impact that this experience might have on sort of that relational unit. And then of course, we land at the center, which is the individual. And there's this element around uh, radical self-reliance as a factor of empowerment that I think is interesting and important. And it of course sort of juxtaposes with this idea that we are connected. We are part of a communal environment that we are not alone necessarily, but nonetheless, what are the ways that we might be able to bolster and enhance and increase our internal capacity, increase our internal capacity for self-compassion, right? Increase our internal capacity through mindfulness, finding all of these ways that we might be able to find a, a sense of support, right? Finding ways that we might be able to relate differently to our, our stories, because I think as a human, one of the powers that we have is to make meaning of the things that we go through. We have that as an option and as an opportunity. And some trauma work, there's one in particular, it's called narrative exposure therapy. And so it's through uh, narratives that somebody might be able to tell about a traumatic experience, you can start to shape and reshift the relationship that they have with that story. And, and so our power to shape our stories in a way that allows us to find access to new ways and new avenues of, of healing, I think are so important. And all of that is something that doesn't have to wait until after psychedelic experiences. But these are all things that people can be boosting and bolstering and increasing their capacity for as part as, as part of this, uh, this ongoing process of, of healing, right? Which doesn't start or end with psychedelics. It's, it's always happening. I tend to see uh, psychedelic experiences sort of the first page in a chapter, right? It's just the first page. There's many more chapters you know, to go, but it's an ongoing sort of process. And so through that process, how can we just find all the ways that we might be able to support ourselves from the inside? Because ultimately, I think what ends up happening is that we find ways that we might be able to then support other people. And it's part of what I consider as being in this mosaic of support. And so to sort of wrap this up, I want to just end with a quote from a fella, Frank Warren, who says, it's the children the world almost breaks who grow up to save it. And I think it's a really beautiful one, right? Because I think so many people here have all of these different levels of trauma and experiences. We've all gone through things. We've all had difficult psychedelic experiences, life experiences. And certainly what ends up happening is we start asking ourselves, we start thinking, we start directing our souls, our spirits, our minds in ways that maybe are not intentional to find ways to support other people who, who went through what we went through, right? And so as an inquiry, I just wanna ask and sort of invite you to think about all of those places where perhaps a, a scar might've turned into a beautiful tattoo and to think a little bit about how you might be able to add to this mosaic of support whether it's for yourself, whether it's for your family, whether it's for your community, whatever that is, there's always something that all of us can offer to the world to make this a better place in some capacity. But certainly it does start with ourselves. So just appreciate all of the time and it's been really lovely. So. so. I guess we'll do some questions. Yeah. <laughs> we got some time. Yeah. Amanda, do I? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I don't need to get a mic. Okay. I, um, I think Luke will, or somebody will repeat the question for sure. Thank you. So many people hope to become a facilitator, a, a psychedelic guide, a therapist. And yet, one of the things that really struck me is um, being under under mentioned, underappreciated, is what happens next. The support that you focused on today, and it, it's a it's not necessarily the same skill set necessarily to be present during the psychedelic session, as then to follow up with their needs on an ongoing basis. And that set really should. Go be, I'm sorry, the setting should go beyond the set and into the support and have some sort of a gaming plan, if you will, that exists that is pre planned after the session. Absolutely. 
So how do you deal with that in your practice? So I feel very fortunate because the company that I'm working with right now is one where the structure is um, a therapist perhaps has had an ongoing relationship with a client for a fair bit of time. Um, and I am a part of this now sort of like three-way um, partnership or collaboration for the patient mm -hmm. where we have an ongoing relationship with the patients offering, of course, from my perspective as a nurse practitioner, um, assessment and sort of the medical pieces of things, prescribing, et cetera. And then, of course, they have their therapist um, and that ongoing relationship. So for people who are going into psychedelic therapy, I mean, I think that um, you make a really good point that holding space in the moment is very different. And I actually don't even see that as therapy, right? So space holding is very different than the actual what therapy would be, which is that whole integration process. So, I mean, it's not, so I would say like going into psychedelic therapy is about not forgetting that you're going into therapy, right? Where psychedelics are something that are being added as a, an additional tool there. Um, and that that's where that skill set comes from. It's like really, really deepening into your practice and holding space for somebody through all of these standing therapeutic principles that, that we, we have. We don't toss all of those out the door because of psychedelics, but I think that a lot of people maybe go into it thinking that, but certainly uh, psychedelic experience, although it can be life-changing the first time, isn't always the case, right? It, it still takes a lot of work. In fact, it probably just shows you what you need to work on. I and mean, okay, you got to get going. Now you got to go actually do the work. I mean, I had an experience that um, maybe it was two years ago now. It was one of the most difficult experiences that I've ever had. <laughs> and I'm still in this ongoing process of integrating, right? I'm still going through that two years later. Um, so part of it, I think, includes from the patient's end or from the client's end, people undergoing psychedelics themselves too, that there's certainly a difference between sort of like intention and expectation, right? And so I think certainly people go into experiences with an intention and an expectation, but that expectation might need to be shifted a little bit, right? Um, and so when you go into an experience thinking, expecting it to be beautiful and colorful and so on and so forth, and it's dark and you're facing your shadow, right? Um, you have to almost like learn how to dance with that. So I think it's important that from both perspectives, as like a clinician, we're thinking about, okay, well, how am I preparing myself through my training, my education to be well-resourced to hold that space? But I think a primary piece here is that for people who are having these experiences on their own, because that's going to make up the vast majority of people using psychedelic medicine, is that they're asking those questions of like, what kind of support do I need, right? Um, that level of empowerment that's going to help them with creating a container for an experience, not just in the moment, but um, in the long term. I'm so lame. Hey, Wendy, thank you so much. I'm so glad you're here. I remember um, you taught during the CIS certificate program, and I remember you were you shut down your slides and you guided us inside. And after such a content heavy day, it was fantastic to come on to our minds together. And I wonder how that shows up in your practice? Or did you speak at all to intersections of environment and psychedelic assisted therapy? Yeah, so um, it's like a couple of ways actually, um, but I think what is coming up is, the, I feel like I wanna share a story um, where I've shared a piece of this story before, but um, in an experience, I was having an experience where it was sort of curated for, you know, I had sort of an expectation for this experience that was happening sort of in partnership. It was something that was meant to be like uh, a union, you know, like an opportunity to be in union and communion with my partner. And I, what I didn't recognize or didn't expect at the time was that what would be happening instead was um, I'd be <laughs> sort of going through a lot of vicarious trauma. So all at the time working in community mental health and working with people with pretty significant trauma. Um, I started having these sort of intrusive thoughts about other people's experiences. And I was having for about a week, you know, sort of like these flashbacks and nightmares. And it was so interesting because I've not heard of something like that happening where it was as if I had lived at these things that I heard about. And the way that I was able to 
work with that was through like connecting with my body, you know, because I could talk through it all in, in therapy. I could talk about it with people. I could, you know, process verbally, but it wasn't until I started actually integrating like physical like movement into actually like moving the emotions around in my body because that's where emotions live. They live in our bodies, not in our minds. Um, and actually laying on the ground at one point and like imagining and visualizing the earth just like taking all of this like pain, you know, just drawing all of the, the, the difficulty that people go through all of the time that we receive, particularly when you're in healthcare. Um, you know, to feel supported in that way, to like embody <laughs> that practice, I think it changed the way that I look at um, self-support through uh, physical and embodied practices. Interestingly, the thing that's become a huge, like my somatic practice is rock climbing, which was also something that was kind of like, oh, it's, I didn't expect that, but cool, you know, <laughs> but still same sort of mind-body practice coordinating with your, your, your physical, you know, breath and movements um, where you're totally mindful and you're just focused on like what's in front of you and doing exactly. And so going through a really difficult day or anything, you know, I bring that onto the wall. So in Buddhism, they say there's many doors and they all lead to the same home. And I think that's certainly true because I've seen people find support through dance Seeing people find support through yoga, of course. Um, seeing people find support through like soccer, right? Um, surfing, all of these things that I think as a common denominator has this like physical element that helps with integrating all of our parts and all of our being um, has been like a dramatically helpful thing for me. So um, in addition to that, you know, I have sort of a, a meditation practice that has been really supported by um, the sort of like the Zen tradition. Um, I think that Ben was talking about his dissertation, which is really cool and really interesting because certainly uh, Zen is the philosophical underpinning for, I think, the way that I'm experiencing a sense of spirit, um, which has its own sort of element around physical embodiment. When within the Zen practice, there's like a stillness, you know, so um, in Zen, they call it Zazen, which stands for just sitting. And so you're instructed to sit still, back straight, you know, and when you start feeling pain, you're just becoming aware of it. We don't want you to move or budge, you know, if you have to go ahead, but like, it's pretty regimented and pretty strict, but you start to develop a different relationship with pain through that. You know, you start to develop a different relationship with just like sensation through that. So I think for me, it's been certainly like an experimentation and exploration. It's always kind of shifting and changing, moving, um, but has been certainly like really helpful in helping me with processing things. So yeah, thank you. Oh, on, on that yes. note, uh, you know, sort of many doors to the same house. Um, you mentioned you work in a ketamine clinic through, through your work in the Psychedelic Society. It seems like you have experience with a couple other uh, psychedelic compounds. Um, ketamine is, you know, fairly dissociative, right? And I've heard folks, uh, say, for example, if they have body dysmorphic disorder or bulimia or other things, they're like the experience of being out of my body is helpful. Mm -hmm. right? Psilocybin, you know, perhaps the experience has less of that dissociative component. Interested to hear your your thoughts on, on that idea of sort of many doors to the same place. Do you think that each of these compounds, is there utility in matching them with particular types of work that's being done or is, is that an irrelevant? Mm. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think the research will show evidence of where the most useful um, approaches are going to be for different conditions. But I think outside of conditions, there's also like a great benefit, I think with ketamine in particular, because it's like really safe. Um, and for a lot of people, it's like a great sort of introduction. And for many people, just only the thing that they ever really needed. Because sometimes it's just about having that shift in perspective. Right. And sometimes a shift, a simple shift in perspective can change your entire life, which is so cool. Right. Just one simple uh, difference in the way that you might see the world that you didn't see before. And so certainly like mindfulness practices can do that, but it might take you 10,000 hours. Now everybody has 10,000 hours to become a monk, <laughs> you know, 
Um, and so it's been beautiful to see that uh, this shift in perspective people have access to through all of these other different forms of, of medicine. So I think the way that perhaps I would hope to see things develop is that people are just met where they're at, right? And so there might be people who feel that psilocybin in fact might be the best medicine based off of their like particular anxiety, let's say, right? Um, but they're so anxious that losing control is not something that they can bear, <laughs> right? And then it's meeting them where, where they're at. So, you know, what are the ways that, you know, we might be able to support you based off of this kind of information that we have? So yeah, just an incorporation of all of these other elements, stigma, fear. I mean, we have a lot of people who are worried about talking to their healthcare practitioners or um, primary care doctors that they're gonna have a psychedelic experience, you know? Um, or to work, do work with ketamine and it's all totally above board, but there's a lot of fear there. And so it's like meeting people where they're at the fear too um, and the worry and the concern. So I think it's really wonderful to see that there would be sort of like a suite of resources, a mosaic of support, if you will, um, where you know you can find what works for that patient or that person in particular. Yeah. There's a question on Zoom. Uh, Hi, I can ask him. <laughs> can you hear me? Oh, yes. Hi. Um, so my question, I have a medical question. Um, and in the spirit of meeting people where they're at, I guess, what are um, your thoughts on clients or patients who are currently on antidepressants or other psychiatric medication? Um, what would the, what would it look like to begin a journey in psychedelic therapy or psychedelic medicine? Mm. So I think a really common question, um, I can speak in particular, just, you know, this isn't advice or anything like want to be clear, not medical advice, but in my practice, in our practice um, with ketamine in particular, it can be used with or without antidepressants. It wouldn't cause any kind of interaction there. Um, I think certainly with the more classical psychedelics, you might have like a dulling of an effect if you're on um, SSRIs. And there are like, not like a great deal of interactions, certainly interactions with MDMA, I think. Uh, well, butrin is one of the, S or, or um, well, butrin is like an antidepressant that potentiates it even. So in that case, it potentiates it with um, SSRIs and sort of the classical psychedelics, it might like dull the effect. But I think ultimately it's going to be a conversation that the person's going to be having with their um, primary care provider um, because you want people to be fully informed, whether it's their psychiatrist, whether it's their PCP. And I think that's another layer of support that we could offer that I didn't really talk too much about. But what happens when somebody is thinking about doing these things and they know that they need to consult their care provider, but they're really afraid to? And so what's really helpful is in having that conversation, um, the way that you uh, present it makes a difference. So when your goal is to reduce the um, sort of consequences of stigma, there are ways in communicating that increase what we would call like a cognitive empathy, meaning you want the person that you're speaking to to understand what my day-to-day -day experience is like and why I'm exploring this, right? So as opposed to, you know, hey doc, you know, I heard a lot of stuff about psychedelics, Michael Pollan's book, I watched Netflix, really want to try it. I think it'd be really great for me. It's a different conversation than saying, I'm having a really hard time getting up for work. I'm having a hard time, like taking care of my kids the way that I need to, you know, I can't like get my chores done and it's really impacting all layers of my life. My work's starting to notice. I've tried these things and I'm realizing and I'm learning that um, all of these things that I'm describing and going through are things that other folks in research have described and gone through and they're finding, finding support here. Can we have a conversation um, so that we can look at things from sort of a harm reduction perspective, if you will, or if you can offer me a little bit of guidance in, in moving forward with this, right? So I think very different conversations there. Um, so that can be helpful for people to just be able to have those those difficult <laughs> chats with their care providers. Thank you. That was so helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think Day, you had a question too, and then I'll come over. 
such density and articulations. It's really beautiful work. I love the word support that you keep using because of how relational it is. And it seems like it asks of us to really consider all of the pieces that are nourishing of our lives as allies. And I wonder about, particularly about other people and the, the role of community there. I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about um, psychedelic culture or psychedelic community as we are all kind of together here in this room, moving towards a greater understanding or appreciation for these experiences. How do we move that into kind of our daily relatings or, or more, mm. um, more generatively like create community around that? Yeah, and so um, to sort of make sure I got the question right. Yeah. How do we, with our knowledge, understanding, experiences of psychedelics, um, integrate those learnings and understandings into our communities? Yeah, and, and particularly support each other. Mm. Um, yeah, being being that support, being that continuation of healing yeah. for each other. So I think the piece that comes up is um, having making sure that you know how to fill your own cups. Mm -hmm as like a as like a foundation which is like hard to do right um but having your cups filled allows you to best be in support of anybody else in any community so it starts with that and i think for people who are having these psychedelic experiences particularly when maybe in their family they don't know about it or they're not like that open to talk about it maybe at work it's not something that like i feel all that comfortable sharing about these things um, I think there's like uh, two different kinds of communication, right? So there's uh, direct communication, which is like, hey, I'm going to this ayahuasca retreat to have this experience. Um, and I have done it before. And it's like a really wonderful experience, like made me a better person. So on and so forth, you can speak it directly. And then there's like the indirect way of communicating, which is like, you're just doing the work. You know, you're just like showing up for yourself. You're just showing up for other people. You know, um, and indirectly that's communicating a lot, right? Oh, this person's really like building their internal reserves. Like this person's really showing up here. There's a lot of work that's happening that nobody else is seeing <laughs> that allows them to be able to hold that space, right? Or even sometimes in many cases, a lot of suffering, right? That leads to that. But I think it really starts there with both of those forms of communication, which is like the indirect and the direct because they have benefits on both ends. So I think in my family, the indirect communication is, I start relating differently to my parents, my siblings, so on and so forth. I'm like reaching out way more often. Like I'm calling just to say, hey mom, just calling and say, I love you, right, bye. You know, like <laughs> that kind of stuff's happening, right? After I'm having like a psychedelic experience and then they might like make a comment. It was like, oh, you're like more of this. So I'm like, I said, yeah, because I had an experience. I use it as an opportunity, it's a window, right? So um, that has really interesting benefit, like to be able to have that um, approach. Um, and then on the direct end, so professionally, when I was working in community mental health, I felt like it was important to talk about these psychedelic experiences. And certainly for people who we were, I, I worked in various settings. One of them was a long-term inpatient rehab. And I just knew that this medicine was going to become so much more a part of our field but of course there's like a lot of hesitancy around it so I started holding these like Q and A's basically it was like myth busting opportunities so I would like after work meet for like 45 minutes you know however long I just want to you know do like an open Q&A about MDMA as psychotherapy because I think that people are curious about it but I don't know if um, they necessarily have good information or whatever so I just want to go ahead and do that so I started doing that and then I started bringing it to all of the nurse practitioners at the organization, started talking with um, sort of leadership at the organization about it, you know, and that form of direct communication helped with building a community of other people who were like, oh, cool, I'm also into that, but I was too scared to say anything. Um, and so now that you are saying something, let's start something, you know, and often that's how psychedelic societies start, right? It's like people who are seeking community, build it, um, you know, so. Yeah, I think you're doing a wonderful job. <laughs> but yeah, I think, yeah, to hammer home that point, really thinking about the two different kinds of communication, both direct and indirect, and knowing sort of the benefits for each. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
And then I think you had your time. Very quick question. Oh, well, it's not quick. I okay. can say you, I can just ask you afterwards. Yeah, that'll be probably good. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So thank you so much, Kwasi. And just a shout out um, that he's also going to be on a panel tomorrow at the Central Museum uh, talking about harm reduction. So if you haven't gotten enough of Kwasi tomorrow, <laughs> uh, tomorrow, but thank you so much for coming. Yeah. Thank you so much. yeah.